What freedom is not. We can understand more clearly what freedom is if we first look at what it is not. Freedom is not rebellion. Rebellion is a normal interim move toward freedom. It occurs to some extent when the little child is trying to exercise his muscles of independence through the power to say no. It occurs more clearly when the adolescent is trying to become independent of parents. In adolescence, as possibly in other stages too, the strength of the rebelliousness against what the parents stand for is often excessive because the young person is fighting his own anxiety at stepping out into the world. When parents say, don't, he often must scream defiance at them, because that don't is exactly what he feels the craven side of himself is saying, the side of himself which is tempted to take refuge behind the walls of parental protection. But rebellion is often confused with freedom itself. It becomes a false port in the storm because it gives the rebel a delusive sense of being really independent. The rebel forgets that rebellion always presupposes an outside structure of rules, laws, expectations against which one is rebelling, and one's security, sense of freedom, and strength are dependent actually on this external structure. They are borrowed and can be taken away like a bank loan which can be called in at any moment. Psychologically, many persons stop at this stage of rebellion. Their sense of inner moral strength comes only from knowing what moral conventions they do not live up to. They get an oblique sense of conviction by proclaiming their atheism and disbelief. Much of the psychological vitality of the 1920s came from rebellion. This is illustrated in the novels of F. Scott Fitzgerald, T. H. Lawrence, and to some extent Sinclair Lewis. It is interesting how, when reading F. Scott Fitzgerald, This Side of Paradise, or his other novels, which were the Bibles of the emancipated young people of his day, to note what a furor is made over kissing a girl, or other actions that now impress us as mere peccadilloes. D. H. Lawrence carried on a great crusade in his novel Lady Chatterley's Lover to proclaim the thesis that Lady Chatterley, whose husband had become paralyzed, had the right to take a lover who happened to be a worker on the estate grounds. A novelist writing that novel today would scarcely find it necessary. So little does sexual freedom now have to be argued to make the husband paralyzed. It was not that the ideas were in themselves unworthy of serious discussion, ideas like free love, free expression, and bringing up children, and so on. It is that they were defined negatively, largely in terms of what one was against. We were against external compulsions on love, against rigidly curtailing the free development of children, and the emphasis, if we take the latter example, was on what the parents must not do. He must not interfere, and, in the extreme forms of the doctrine, the child must be allowed to do anything he wishes. It was not seen that such structureless living actually increased children's anxiety. It also was not seen that the parent must obviously take a good deal of responsibility for the child's actions, and that positive freedom consists of the parents doing this in the context of a genuine respect for the child as a person, actually and potentially, that he give all realistic room for the potentialities of the child to develop, and that he not require the child to falsify his wants and emotions. Those of us who were in college in the late 1920s recall what a sense of power we got from the causes and crusades, from knowing so staunchly what we were rebelling against, be it war, or sexual taboos, or companionate marriage, or booze, or prohibition, or whatnot. But now a rebel in the sense would have a hard time getting an audience. H. L. Mencken, the great iconoclast, was the high priest of those years, and it seemed everybody on the campus read him. Who reads him now? Today this kind of rebelling is all rather boring, for when there are no set standards to rebel against, one gets no power from rebelling. It is not that the bank called in the loan, the bank simply collapsed, and no loan had any worth anymore.
By the middle of our century, the process of demolishment begun back in the 19th century, a demolishment that is one side of the transformation of standards, has done its work, and we are reaping emptiness and bewilderment. All the sad young men, like those the early F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about, got a sense of potency from kissing a girl, but since that is now routine and gives one no special feeling of power, these are the young men who have had to search within themselves for their potency, and in so many cases have found it lacking. Since the rebel gets his sense of direction and vitality from attacking the existing standards and mores, he does not have to develop standards of his own. Rebellion acts as a substitute for the more difficult process of struggling through one's own autonomy, to new beliefs, to the state where one can lay new foundations on which to build. The negative forms of freedom confused freedom with license, and overlooked the fact that freedom is never the opposite of responsibility. Another common error is to confuse freedom with planlessness. Some writers these days argue that if the system of economic laissez-faire, letting everyone do as he wishes, were altered as history marches on, our freedom would vanish with it. The argument of these authors often goes something like this. Freedom is like a living thing. It is indivisible, and if the individual's right to own the means of production is taken away, he no longer has the freedom to earn his living in his own way. Then he can have no freedom at all. Well, if these writers were right, it would indeed be unfortunate, for who then could be free? Not you, nor I, nor anyone else except a very small group of persons, for in this day of giant industries, only the minutest fraction of citizens can own the means of production anyway. Laissez-faire was a great idea, as we have seen in earlier centuries, but times change, and almost everyone nowadays earns his living by virtue of belonging to a large group, be it an industry, or a university, or a labor union. It is a vastly more interdependent world, this one world of our 20th century, than the world of the entrepreneurs of earlier centuries or of our own pioneer days. And freedom must be found in the context of economic community and the social value of work, not in everyone's setting up his own factory or university. Fortunately, this economic interdependence need not destroy freedom if we keep our perspective. The Pony Express was a great idea, also, back in the days when sending a letter from coast to coast was an adventure. But certainly we are thankful, complain as we may about mail service these days, that now when we write a letter to a friend on the coast, we don't have to give more than a passing thought to its method of travel. We drop it in the box with an airmail stamp and forget about it. We are free, that is, to devote more time and concern to our message to our friend our intellectual and spiritual interchange in the letter, because in a world made smaller by specialized communication, we don't have to be so concerned about how the letter gets there. We are more free intellectually and spiritually precisely because we accept our position in economic interdependence with our fellow men. I have often wondered why there is such anxiety and such an outcry that freedom will be lost unless we preserve the old laissez-faire practices. Is not one of the few reasons the fact that modern man has so thoroughly surrendered inward psychological and spiritual freedom to the routine of his work and to the mass patterns of social conventions that he feels the only vestige of freedom left to him is the opportunity for economic aggrandizement? Has he made the freedom to compete with his neighbor economically a last remnant of individuality? which therefore must stand for the whole meaning of freedom? That is to say, if the citizen of the suburbs could not buy a new car each year, build a bigger house, and paint it a slightly different color from his neighbors, might he feel that his life would have no purpose and that he would not exist as a person? The great weight placed on competitive laissez-faire freedom seems to me to show how much we have lost a real understanding of freedom. To be sure, freedom is indivisible, and this is precisely why one cannot identify it with a particular economic doctrine or segment of life, least of all a segment of the past. 
It is a living thing, and its life comes precisely from how the whole person relates himself to the community of his fellow men. Freedom means openness, a readiness to grow. It means being flexible, ready to change for the sake of greater human values. To identify freedom with a given system is to deny freedom. It crystallizes freedom and turns it into dogma. To cling to a tradition with the defensive plea that if we lose something that worked well in the past, we will have lost all, neither shows the spirit of freedom nor makes for the future growth of freedom. We shall keep faith with those courageous men, the pioneer industrialists, the men of commerce, and the capitalists of the 16th to 19th centuries in the Western world, as well as with the independent frontiersmen of our own country, if we emulate their courage, dare to think boldly as they did, and plan the most effective economic measures for our day as they did for theirs. This book is on psychology rather than economics or sociology, and we touch on the larger picture only because man always lives in a social world, and that world conditions his psychological health. We simply propose that our social and economic ideal be that society which gives the maximum opportunity for each person in it to realize himself, to develop and use his potentialities, and to labor as a human being of dignity, giving to and receiving from his fellow men. The good society is, thus, the one which gives the greatest freedom to its people, freedom defined not negatively and defensively, but positively as the opportunity to realize ever greater human values. It follows that collectivism, as in fascism and communism, is the denial of these values, and must be opposed at all costs, but we shall successfully overcome them only as we are devoted to positive ideals which are better, chiefly the building of a society based on a genuine respect for persons and their freedom. What freedom is? Freedom is man's capacity to take a hand in his own development. It is our capacity to mold ourselves. Freedom is the other side of consciousness of self. If we were not able to be aware of ourselves, we would be pushed along by instinct or the automatic march of history, like bees or mastodons. But by our power to be conscious of ourselves, we can call to mind how we acted yesterday or last month, and by learning from these actions we can influence, even if ever so little, how we act today. And we can picture in imagination some situation tomorrow, say a dinner date, or an appointment for a job, or a board of directors meeting. And by turning over in fantasy different alternatives for acting, we can pick the one which will do best for us. Consciousness of self gives us the power to stand outside the rigid chain of stimulus and response, to pause, and by this pause to throw some weight on either side, to cast some decision about what the response will be. That consciousness of self and freedom go together is shown in the fact that the less self-awareness a person has, the more he is unfree. That is to say, the more he is controlled by inhibitions, repressions, childhood conditionings which he has consciously forgotten, but which still drive him unconsciously, the more he is pushed by forces over which he has no control. When persons first come for psychotherapeutic help, for example, they generally complain that they are driven in any number of ways. They have sudden anxieties or fears, or are blocked in studying or working without any appropriate reason. They are unfree, that is, bound and pushed by unconscious patterns. It may be after some months of psychotherapeutic work, little changes begin to appear. The person begins to recall his dreams regularly, or in one session he takes the initiative in stating that he wants to change the subject on hand and get some help on a different problem. Or one day he can say that he felt angry when the therapist said such and such, or he is able to cry when previously he never could feel much of anything, or suddenly he laughs with spontaneity and wholeheartedness, or is able to state he doesn't like Mary with whom he has been conventional friends for years but does like Carolyn. In such ways, slight as they may seem, his emerging self-awareness goes hand in hand with his enlarging power to direct his own life. 
as the person gains more consciousness of self, his range of choice and his freedom proportionately increase. Freedom is cumulative. One choice made with an element of freedom makes greater freedom possible for the next choice. Each exercise of freedom enlarges the circumference of the circle of oneself. We do not mean to imply that there are not an infinite number of deterministic influences in anyone's life. If you wish to argue that we are determined by our bodies, by our economic situation, by the fact that we happen to be born into the 20th century in America, and so on, I would agree with you, and I would add many more ways in which we are psychologically determined, particularly by tendencies of which we are unconscious. But no matter how much one argues for the deterministic viewpoint, he still must grant that there is a margin in which the alive human being can be aware of what is determining him, and even if only in a very minute way to begin with, he can have some say in how he will react to the deterministic factors. Freedom is thus shown in how we relate to the deterministic realities of life. If you set out to write a sonnet, you run up against all kinds of recalcitrant realities in the laws of rhyme and scanning, and in the necessity of fitting words together. Or if you build a house, you confront all kinds of determining elements in bricks and mortar and lumber. It is essential that you know your material and accept its limits. But what you say in the sonnet, as Alfred Adler used to emphasize, is uniquely yours. The pattern and the style in which you build your house are products of how you, with an element of freedom, use the reality of the given materials. The arguments of freedom versus determination are on a false basis, just as it is false to think of freedom as a kind of isolated electric button called free will. Freedom is shown in according one's life with realities realities as simple as the needs for rest and food, or as ultimate as death. Meister Eckhart expressed this approach to freedom in one of his astute psychological counsels. When you are thwarted, it is your own attitude that is out of order. Freedom is involved when we accept the realities not by blind necessity but by choice. This means that the acceptance of limitations need not at all be a giving up, but can and should be a constructive act of freedom, and it may well be that such a choice will have more creative results for the person than if he had not had to struggle against any limitation whatever. The man who is devoted to freedom does not waste time fighting reality. Instead, as Kierkegaard remarked, he extols reality. Let us take as an illustration a situation in which people are very much controlled, namely when they are sick with a disease like tuberculosis. In almost every action they are rigidly conditioned by the facts that they are in a sanatorium under a strict regime, have to rest such and such time, can walk only 15 minutes a day, and so on. But there is all the difference in the world in how persons relate to the reality of the disease. Some give up, and literally invite their own deaths. Others do what they are supposed to do, but they continually resent the fact that nature, or God, has given them such a disease, and though they outwardly obey, they inwardly rebel against the rules. These patients generally don't die, but neither do they get well. Like rebels in any area in life, they remain on a plateau perpetually marking time. Other patients, however, frankly confront the fact that they are very seriously ill. They let this tragic fact sink into consciousness through plentiful hours of contemplation as they lie in beds on a sanatorium porch. They seek in their consciousness of self to understand what was wrong in their lives beforehand that they should have succumbed to the illness. They use the cruelly deterministic fact of being sick as an avenue to new self-knowledge. They are the patients who can best choose and affirm the methods and the self-discipline, which never can be put into rules, but vary from day to day, which will bring them victoriously through the disease. 
They are the ones who not only achieve physical health, but who are ultimately enlarged, enriched, and strengthened by the experience of having had the disease. They affirm their elemental freedom to know and to mold deterministic events. They meet a severely deterministic fact with freedom. It is doubtful whether anyone really achieves health who does not responsibly choose to be healthy, and whoever does so choose becomes more integrated as a person by virtue of having had a disease. Through his power to survey his life, man can transcend the immediate events which determine him. Whether he has tuberculosis, or is a slave like the Roman philosopher Epictetus, or a prisoner condemned to death, he can still in his freedom choose how he will relate to these facts. And how he relates to a merciless, realistic fact like death can be more important for him than the fact of death itself. Freedom is most dramatically illustrated in the heroic actions, like Socrates' decision to drink the hemlock rather than compromise. But even more significant is the undramatic, steady day-to-day -day exercise of freedom on the part of any person developing towards psychological and spiritual integration in a distraught society like our own. Thus, freedom is not just the matter of saying yes or no to a specific decision, it is the power to mold and create ourselves. Freedom is the capacity, to use Nietzsche's phrase, to become what we truly are. Freedom and structure. Freedom never occurs in a vacuum. It is not anarchy. Earlier in this book, we pointed out how the self-consciousness of the child is born in the structure of his relations with his parents. And we emphasized that the psychological freedom of the human being develops not as though he were a Robinson Crusoe on a desert island, but in continual interaction with the other significant persons in his world. Freedom does not mean trying to live in isolation. It does mean that when one is able to confront his isolation, he is able consciously to choose to act with some responsibility in the structure of his relations with the world, especially the world of other persons around him. The absurd results which can occur when the structure is not adequately emphasized are seen in some of the writings of the leader of French existentialism, Jean-Paul Sartre. The chief character in Sartre's novel Age of Reason, apparently being portrayed as acting in freedom, actually moves along in whim and indecision, his actions motivated by the nightly recurrence of sexual desire, by his mistress's expectations of him, and by other accidental external happenings. As a result, one has the impression, in reading the book, of vacuity and emptiness, and one feels inclined to ask in mild boredom, who cares? The mood engendered by the novel is precisely the opposite to the concern for the individual and his freedom that Sartre upholds in theory. In Sartre's drama, The Red Gloves, the communist hero lacks the decisiveness to fulfill his mission of assassinating the dictator, and finally is goaded into it only when he discovers his wife in the other man's arms. Hence, the reviewers of the play described the hero, and I believe not unfairly, as acting like a grown-up boy scout with especially active sexual jealousy. The essence of existentialism, of the Sartrean as well as other varieties, is its belief in the capacity of the individual to care greatly about his freedom and inner integrity, enough to die or commit suicide for them if need be. Sartrean existentialism was born in the resistance movement in the last war in France, in which Sartre and others fought with great courage, and it would seem that the movement borrowed much of its vitality and its structure from this fight for France's freedom. But something is wrong when such a movement becomes, as travelers from France tell us, a sophisticated fad, a rallying point for the young Parisian dilettantes. We agree with the fundamental Sartrean precept that the individual has no recourse from the necessity of making final decisions for himself, and that his existence as a person hangs or falls in these choices, 
and to make them in the last analysis in freedom and isolation may require literally as well as figuratively an agony of anxiety and inward struggle. But the fact that human beings can choose with some freedom, and that they will at times die for this freedom, both very strange things, quite contrary to any simple doctrine of self-preservation, implies some profound things about human nature and human existence. No one will die for the negative side of a debate, or for any other negation. A person may die for a lost cause, but he is dying for very powerful positive values, such as his own dignity and integrity. The emptiness of the Sartrean viewpoint arises from the failure to analyze those very presuppositions in the freedom which he is avowedly dedicated to. One wonders what will happen to Sartre's existentialism as it gets farther away from the French resistance movement. Some astute critics have stated it may go authoritarian. Tillich believes it may go into Catholicism, and Marcel predicts it will go Marxist. It is not our purpose here to go into detail about what specifically should be the structure of one's relations with the world. There are many different approaches. The Greeks called it logos, hence the term logical. The Stoics had the concept of natural law, the given form of life by which one had to live to be happy. In the 17th and 18th centuries, there was the belief in universal reason. We only wish to emphasize that thinking persons all through the ages have sought to describe in different ways some structure, and that very individual assumes, consciously or unconsciously, some structure in which he acts. Most people tend to assume certain rules which arise from their unconscious conformity to what is expected by the society. What we have described as conformity and authoritarianism serve as the unconsciously assumed structure for many people in our day. In any case, it is better to ask oneself quite consciously what structure one assumes. Working out an adequate view of structure is, of course, a problem for philosophy, religion, and ethics working with the social sciences, including psychology. In this book, we deal chiefly with psychology and have pointed out already some of the evidence from our psychological understanding of the individual's needs and relationships which bears on the question of structure. In the succeeding chapters, we shall deal more with the question of what kind of structure, in ethics, philosophy, and religion, makes for the fullest realization of the potentialities of the individual person. Choosing oneself. Freedom does not come automatically. It is achieved. And it is not gained at a single bound. It must be achieved each day. As Goethe forcefully expresses the ultimate lesson learned by Faust, quote, Yes, to this thought I hold with firm persistence. The last result of wisdom stamps it true. He only earns his freedom and existence who daily conquers them anew. The basic step in achieving inward freedom is choosing oneself. This strange-sounding phrase of Kierkegaard's means to affirm one's responsibility for oneself and one's existence. It is the attitude which is opposite to blind momentum or routine existence. It is an attitude of aliveness and decisiveness. It means that one recognizes that he exists in his particular spot in the universe, and he accepts the responsibility for this existence. This is what Nietzsche meant by the will to live, not simply the instinct for self-preservation, but the will to accept the fact that one is oneself, and to accept responsibility for fulfilling one's own destiny, which in turn implies accepting the fact that one must make his basic choices himself. We can see more clearly what choosing oneself and one's existence means by looking at the opposite, choosing not to exist, that is, to commit suicide. The significance of suicide lies not in the fact that people actually kill themselves in any large numbers, it is indeed a very rare occurrence except among psychotics, but psychologically and spiritually the thought of suicide has a much wider meaning. 
there is such a thing as psychological suicide in which one does not take his own life by a given act, but dies because he has chosen, perhaps without being entirely aware of it, not to live. Not infrequently, one hears of incidents like that in the disaster not long ago of a sinking fishing boat. A young man in his twenties clung in the choppy waters to a floating timber with an older man for an hour or so, and talked to the older man about how he felt too young to die. Finally, with the words, I'm finished, goodbye, Pop, he let go of the timber and sank. Of course, we do not know the inner psychological processes in the fact that a person, apparently with some strength left, seems to give up and die, but it is a fair guess that some inner tendency not to choose to live is in operation. Another illustration is in the lives of persons who have dedicated themselves to certain tasks, such as taking care of a sick loved one or finishing an important work. They keep going under difficult circumstances as though they had determined they had to live, and then when the task is completed, when success is attained, they proceed to die as though by some inner decision. Kierkegaard wrote 20 books in 14 years, completed them at the early age of 42, and then, we almost say in conclusion, he took to his bed and died. These ways of choosing not to live show how crucial it can be to choose to live. It is doubtful whether anyone really begins to live, that is, to affirm and choose his own existence, until he has frankly confronted the terrifying fact that he could wipe out his existence but chooses not to. Since one is free to die, he is free also to live. The mass patterns of routine are broken. He no longer exists as an accidental result of his parents having conceived him, of his growing up and living as an infinitesimal item on the treadmill of cause and effect, marrying, begetting new children, growing old, and dying. Since he could have chosen to die but chose not to, every act thereafter has to some extent been made possible because of that choice. Every act then has its special element of freedom. People often actually go through the experience of committing psychological suicide in some sector of their lives. We shall present two illustrations which we hope will make the basic point clear. A woman believes she cannot live unless a certain man loves her. When he marries someone else, she contemplates suicide. In the course of her meditating on the idea for some days, she fantasies, well, assume I did do it. But then she suddenly thinks, after I've done it, it would still be good to be alive in other ways. The sun still shines. Water is still cool to the body. One can still make things. And the suggestion creeps in that there may still be other people to love. So she decides to live. Assuming the decision is made for positive reasons rather than just the fear of dying or inertia, the conflict may actually have given her some new freedom. It is as though the part of her which clung to the man did commit suicide, and as a result, she can begin life anew. This is the increased aliveness Edna St. Vincent Millay describes in Renaissance. Ah, up from the ground sprang I, and hailed the earth with such a cry, as is not heard save from a man who has been dead, and lives again. Or a young man feels he can never be happy unless he gains some fame. He begins to realize that he is competent and valuable, let us say as an assistant professor. But the higher he gets on the ladder, the clearer he sees that there are always persons above him, that many are called but few are chosen, that very few people gain fame anyway, and that he may end up just a good and competent teacher. He might then feel that he would be as insignificant as a grain of sand, his life meaningless, and he might as well not be alive. The idea of suicide creeps into his mind in his more despondent moods. Sooner or later, he too thinks, all right, assume I've done it, what then? And it suddenly dawns on him that, if he came back after the suicide, there would be a lot left in life, even if one were not famous. 
He then chooses to go on living, as it were, without the demand for fame. It is as though the part of him which would not live without fame does commit suicide. And in killing the demand for fame, he may also realize as a byproduct that the things which yield lasting joy and inner security have very little to do with the external and fickle standards of public opinion anyway. He may then appreciate the more flippant wisdom in Ernest Hemingway's remark, Who the hell wants fame over the weekend? I want to write well. And finally, as a result of the partial suicide, he may clarify his own goals and arrive at more of a feeling for the joy which comes from fulfilling his own potentialities, from finding and teaching the truth as he sees it, and adding his own unique contribution arising from his own integrity rather than the servitude to fame. We would emphasize again that the actual process of these partial psychological suicides is much more complex than these illustrations imply. Actually, some people, perhaps most people, move in the opposite direction when they have to renounce a demand. They retreat, constrict their lives, and become less free. But we wish only to make clear that there is a positive aspect to partial suicide and that the dying of one attitude or need may be the other side of the birth of something new, which is a law of growth in nature, not at all limited to human beings. One can choose to kill a neurotic strategy, a dependency, a clinging, and then find that he can choose to live as a freer self. The woman in our example would no doubt find with clearer insight that her so-called love for the man for whom she would have committed suicide was really not love at all, but clinging parasitism balanced by desire to have power over the man. A dying to part of oneself is often followed by a heightened awareness of life, a heightened sense of possibility. When one has consciously chosen to live, two other things happen. First, his responsibility for himself takes on a new meaning. He accepts responsibility for his own life not as something with which he has been saddled, a burden forced upon him, but as a something he has chosen himself. For this person, himself, now exists as a result of a decision he himself has made. To be sure, any thinking person realizes in theory that freedom and responsibility go together. If one is not free, one is an automaton and there is obviously no such thing as responsibility, and if one cannot be responsible for himself, he can't be trusted with freedom. But when one has chosen himself, this partnership of freedom and responsibility becomes more than a nice idea. He experiences it on his own pulse. In his choosing himself, he becomes aware that he has chosen personal freedom and responsibility for himself in the same breath. The other thing which happens is that discipline from the outside is changed into self-discipline. He accepts discipline not because it is commanded, for who can command someone who has been free to take his own life, but because he has chosen with greater freedom what he wants to do with his own life, and discipline is necessary for the sake of the values he wishes to achieve. This self-discipline can be given fancy names. Nietzsche called it loving one's fate, and Spinoza spoke of obedience to the laws of life. But whether bedecked by fancy terms or not, it is, I believe, a lesson everyone progressively learns in his struggle toward maturity.